Well, thank you for coming. Um, I hope you've all got the link to the the book down book. Um, and there was a short. There's a short bit of code to run to set up everything. So almost everything I do, you could follow along with with the code that's in the book. Um, There's three main sections. So I'm going to talk about polar mapping in general um, and data handling and some of the tricks that I've learned for how to make things efficient. Um, and I work a lot with different projections. Like you tend to be able to work between them effectively without having to push everything into the same projection. And that can be really important for efficiency. Um, and then finally, just a little bit about a mapping package that we've created that bakes in some of these tricks and makes it easier like to just make a map because that is kind of the most common complaint on the floor of our work is like I've just got some data I measured in the field and I want to get started making a map and there's all these difficulties. Um, there's some simple data sets that get downloaded and installed in your session. so. And I'm really looking at stuff from the maps package, from the map tools package. There's a couple of rasters that I get in in different projections to demonstrate things. And then there's some polygons that we use to define these partitions in the Southern Ocean that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the setup is really these packages. So there's ggplot, maps, map tools, raster, sp, dplyr, and rgdow. So if you don't have those, then this code should install them for you. So just let me know if, you've, if, you, if you can't get that set up. Um, then there's a little section which will download a file off GitHub, and it just downloads an R data file to your local directory and then loads it in. So it's kind of assumed that these objects are in memory for the rest of the session. There is a little bit of code that you won't necessarily be able to run, but I'll, I'll show it to just to demonstrate some some things. So it sound, this sounds a bit dry, but really shape and feature orientations, the date line and the poles. These, I sort of got to a point, I, th I sort of thought you could just reproject between things and, and things would work, but it's not like that. Like the way we saw polygons and lines, there just, there just isn't a kind of one single solution. You've kind of got to assess the situation that you're in and make decisions that are best for that context. And there's quite a number of colleagues, like the date line is, is constantly a problem because people in the Southern Ocean will quite often do work in the Ross Sea, so they're, they're kind of crossing that 180 line back and forth and it doesn't mean anything to them that that's the edge of our longitude latitude map. Um, and really, in, in one sense, using a projection is the right way to do it. You know, the, 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 a projection that, that, that traverses the date line doesn't care about the date line being the singularity. Um, but we, we do just tend to store data in long lat. And I think that's more true in, in marine studies. And it's more true in um, global studies or very like hemispheric wide kind of studies. Like, um, and, and we don't really work with really precise data. You know, normally it's like within a few kilometres. Like if we, if, we, if we measured something off the ship, we know exactly where the ship is to within a few tens of metres. But normally that's not important for ecosystem science in the Southern Ocean. So, so sometimes like really detailed technical accuracy is just a problem. Like it's not, it's, it's unnecessary. Um, Points, lines, and polygons project pretty straightforward, but they don't necessarily wrap properly. Like, you know, you can have tears and folds that, that don't make sense when you're when you're crossing coordinate systems. Um, and something that took me a while to get my head around is things like vector fields. So, like, we look at data for currents, like winds and surface currents in the Southern Ocean, and they're inherently two vari like bivariate because you've got a you've got a um, direction and magnitude, or you've got a horizontal and a vertical component to that vector. 
and you can't just you can't just reproject a, a vector field like um, even though it's very helpful for me to do that because if we're doing particle tracking around the, the ocean I don't want a map that has en edges where things can fall off and it's much easier to work in a in a polar projection um, and then we constantly because I, I work with a lot of different data sets across a lot of different projects you, s you literally see every kind of way of storing things lots of Lots of kind of global data sets work in minus 180 to 180. But then others, often from climate models, work in 0 to 360. And it's really that Atlantic view, Atlantic-centric view, or that Pacific-centric view. And it kind of just a historical accident of where that came from. There's other much more complicated orientations, like you'll see, you'll see grids that are centred on some other arbitrary lat longitude, or they've even got one side of the field on the other side of the data, just for, that's how the systems work. And there's no sort of single fix for those things. Um, projections in general, so this is really brief. There's a lot more to this, but the, the key things are like, can I calculate area in X and Y? Can I calculate distance in X and Y? And are the shapes being true to what their real shape is? Are the angles right? And you can't... You can't have all three. You can sort of have a combination of, of two, but it, it really depends. Like you can actually have a really small region and it, all of these are good enough. Um, but it, it really depends. Like if, if things are traveling really far or they might be coming from all kinds of different parts of the globe. So we, we track animal species that fly from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere and we need sort of general stuff that'll always be right. So we don't do that in a projection. We just calculate distance off long and late. Um, equal area is kind of simple, like it's true that if you have an equal area projection you can calculate the area of polygons anywhere and it's, and it's going to be correct. They might be stretched in a way that doesn't make sense in terms of what it looks like in the real world but it'll, it'll be correct within the limits of, some, well there are still limits on sometimes what the shapes can do. Um, but equidistant is more, is not as simple, like, like you really you really have to be along a particular axis of a projection for the distance property to be preserved, or you have to be between a known, a fixed point that's the centre of the centre of the projection and any other point. So it's kind of constrained in a way that area isn't. And and in practice, that means that I will use equal area projections to calculate area, but I tend to do distance on the ellipsoid with some function that that does that for me. And the last important property is conformal, so it preserves shape. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, an illustration of what's the difference between an equal area projection and a conformal projection when they're otherwise the same, like they're centred in the same place, they've got the same orientation. And I think that's quite instructive to see what's different. Um, so none of these is perfect and quite often we work in geographic coordinates and that can be quite slower and you've got to be careful. You've, you've still got to be careful with how these things are done. But that's why we, we do tend to have tools that do that. Um, when we specify a projection, it's mostly done by choosing an EPSG code. Um, you, can, you, can specify, you, can, you can write your own custom projection as a proj string or various other formats. Um, but I don't see a lot of that happening online. I see people mostly are looking for an EPSG code that suits their data. It doesn't always exist. So, um, There's a little section on the PROJ4 string. So we do have to be careful because, as Roger says, this, this system is going to get deprecated pretty quickly and we'd be advised not to really use it. But there's going to be something analogous to this, this system. And so... I mean, I think these are kind of mysterious. And until I kind of learnt what they meant and, and used them a lot myself, I, was, I just found them kind of indecipherable code. Um, but the, the, thing, the most important thing is this proj, and that's a projection family. So there's all kinds of projections. And so up here, these are types of properties they preserve, but there are, there are various families of projection that that have a particular name because a couple of hundred years ago someone figured out and that was their name or they, they had a particular mathematical property and it's called that. So you'll see Lambert as a methylical area and you'll see stereographic and orthographic, Makeda, 
Lambert Conformal Conic. So sometimes they have a name of the author and sometimes they're just a bit more mathematical. And so in terms of that proj component, so this is a string composed of components and the plus proj, the plus just means that's, that's the separator, you know, between tokens. But LAEA is Lambert Azimuth Allelical Area and there's a big long list of these that we can call on. If we go down the next one, this polar stereographic and this is for the South Pole. So there's... A stereographic projection can be anywhere, but typically we use them centred on the South Pole or the North Pole. It's got a different name. It's got that first five letters of stereographic. And the, thing that makes, the only thing that makes it south is that the, the central latitude, lat zero, is minus 90. And if you look up here, like that's common across these two projections, just because I, I said so. That's where I wanted it to, to be centred. Some of these parameters don't have to be specified. They've got defaults like zero. So that's why you see this really confusing language of tokens for the way that these things get, get made. The datum is there because that's really a, not a sphere, like a flattened ellipsoid, and it's orientated in a certain way to, to approximate the Earth. And in some sense, a family of ellipsoids that approximates the Earth is quite simple, but then there are really complicated grids for doing surveying level accuracy. And that's why Roger was talking about those much more complicated things when you, you get down to metre and sub-metre accuracy. But for hemispheric stuff with kilometre accuracy, you know, we can say datum equals dat WGS84. Where, where you'll see... I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, longitude, latitude... You know, this is really important because we sometimes just assume that our data is longitude, latitude without putting a formal specification of what the projection is. And that's important both so that, you know, tools know, how to know that they're transforming from longitude, latitude or they're transforming from a projection to longitude, latitude. But the other important thing is that the datum really matters. Like this, this might actually be a sphere or it might be the unit sphere. You, you know, you can specify the the two axes of the sphere exactly for, what, for whatever size you want. Or you can have a lookup for a particular defined ellipsoid. Um, this one's a bit more complicated. So stereographic and azimuth allelical area, you really only need this central point. But with Lamb Lambert conformal conic, it's got these extra lat parameters. So it's got lat zero, but then it's got lat one and lat two. And that's because, I actually wish I'd had some props for this, but, but literally you have, the, you have the sphere, you have the cone, and you stick the cone on the sphere, and it's either tangent exactly to the surface of the sphere or it's secant to it. So if it cuts through at two places, it's secant. And if we set the latitude zero to minus 42 for these, that would make it tangent. Like there's no, you know, the cone's not offset into the sphere at all. Um, and these, these ones are a bit more specialist. They, they tend to get used for local authorities for, you know, like, like Victoria in Australia uses this as their state, as their state projection. Um, in terms of global stuff, you know, these are the two that I use the most commonly. But I might centre them somewhere else. The North Pole or put, put longitude 180 to the north or, or, or up. And that that's central long lat's really the, th the common thing they all share. They'll default to zero if you don't specify it. You see these other tokens, and this one doesn't... This wouldn't change the look of the map at all. It just changes the coordinates that come out. So X and Y get shifted by this plus X plus Y offset. And that's called a false easting and a false northing. And you might see... that If you look at grid top topographic maps of your local region, you'll see this kind of... You know, they've got... They've got rules for how you're specifying numbers in metres in the X direction and numbers in the metres in the north direction. The false easting and northing just make sure zero is not in the middle of the map. Um, lat zero, lat one, which I didn't put there in lat two, that's for the conics. Um, 
There's various datum and ellipsoid stuff. I don't really understand this stuff. Like this is a Roger level thing that it's kind of on my list to really pay attention to and understand better. Over is kind of a funny one. That's meant to specify that we're in Pacific view. So we've gone over the date line, but we're keeping the Western Hemisphere to our right. It kind of works sometimes, but you know it's not really integrated as at a deep level as something you can use. LAT-TS is a latitude of true scale, and that's specific to stereographic. Um, I'm going to show these. I've got some spherical plots coming, but a stereographic is... I, I find it f it's sort of easier to describe with my arms, I think so. If you've got the sphere, a north pole up here, and the sphere is sitting on the plane, the plane is the projection, like the plane is the map, and you're shining a light from the North Pole. That's what stereographic do. It goes, it goes through the Earth and it intersects Hobart, you know, in Tasmania, where I live. And that ray just then goes out. And where it hits the plane is where its coordinate is, in, is on that map. The latitude of true scale just says where does the plane intersect the sphere or not. And it'll default to simply being at the, at the South Pole. But if I say it's true scale of minus 71, it actually brings it up to the, approximately the coast of Antarctica. And so the Antarctic authorities would use that because it, it means that the distortion in distance and area is minimised around the Antarctic coast. So there's kind of real world meanings to these kind of mysterious tokens. There's other projection specific stuff like zone and, and south and that's really for UTM. So zone for UTM is really a... You've got... Um, I'll say this wrong, however many there are. You know, there's 60 of them. And really the zone is a lookup for a central longitude. It's saying this is a, a universal transverse Mercator projection. It's centred on this longitude. But it's just a lookup that says there's 60 longitudes where we define this. And south typically sets it up so that it's in the southern hemisphere, not the north. And of course the north is the default, so it doesn't need to be specified. Um, you know... So again, you can you can you can go and find these EPSG codes, and I, I don't have many of these memorized. Like I memorize four three two six because that's WGS eighty four long lat. But I, I I put a few here just for example. So that's South Pole stereographic. The South Pole equal area, and these are defined as EPSG because they're used pretty commonly. Like authorities of remote sensing data publish data using these projections. Um, and then there's the North Pole equivalents. But they might have a, a different kind of longitude centre or a different ellipsoid. And that's something I had to figure out for the sea ice data. Old school in R, we can kind of format a string with this, this integer code. So it's plus in it. It kind of says um, what's coming is not a proj string, but not a proj family string, but a, a lookup code that will find out all those parameters. And then with SP, you had this kind of long-winded CRS args out of RGDAO to, to resolve that into a proj string. It's simpler in SF because you just give it the integer. You can give it the proj4 string, you can give it this string, or you can just give it the number. So it's much easier to actually explore these things and discover them than it used to be. Um, so mapping in R. So here I've got... SP, raster, maps and RG down. It's pretty old school. I load up the world simple package, a uh, data set. Like, has anyone not used world simple out of the map tools package? It's like a, it's like a country's world coastline data set. So you'll often see this on Stack Overflow because it's a good like example for, for debugging or demonstrating some question that you've got. Although it's very politically insensitive, it's very out of date. Um, even older than that is the maps package, and it just has this lines coastline. So we can we can we can just call maps map, and it'll it'll build this long lap picture of the Earth. And I find that really handy because sometimes I just I've plotted some data down here or or over here or somewhere, and I can just say maps map out equals true, and it's it's a very simple way to get a the coastline on, into R. 
we can get the data that's used by this function by saving the call to maps to, to an object. And I have to say, plot equals false, otherwise it'll plot it as well. Um, here I'm actually, I'm getting the longitude and latitude out into a matrix so that I can, I can work with them more directly. And th the point here is that th this is really just a line. So the coastline of Antarctica here, it extends from minus 180 to 180, but it doesn't actually close as a polygon. They're just the data points. It's I wouldn't have, I didn't notice until I made this plot, but there's a little bit of Russia, the Tukotka Peninsula that's actually in the Western Hemisphere. But MAPS is plotting it here in the east. Because it, it looks better by default, right? Until you really need your data to, to have that on the other side. Um, and the other part is this, you know, Antarctica is not going to the South Pole because it's a coastline. It doesn't actually, the coastline doesn't go to the south. If you look at map tools, they've actually sealed it off and they made this little dummy point. And actually, you, have to, you, have, you, can't, you can't close this polygon with the maps package because, see, this is, this is slightly to the north. So if we actually crossed it back here, it's going to intersect itself and be invalid. Um, and, but this, this world simple polygon data set, it aligns exactly with minus 180, minus 180, 180, minus 90, 90. And this plot's just showing that more clearly. It shares those extents exactly. There's nothing in the north. That little bit of Russia is over here. You know, so someone had to do that. Someone actually had to go and kind of carefully change that shape to be in that orientation. Um, I've got little exercises throughout, but I think I'll just leave them for the end if we need them. The other point about the maps package is we can't really draw polygons with it. Like, like for a full world map, I think fill will work, but you can't crop it and generally treat it as polygons. It's just not going to work. This just shows in more detail that the, the blue line is the maps coastline, the grey is the polygon in the in the maps map tools package. And the blue just does not extend to the to the south. It took me a long time to understand this, but the reason for that is the coastline of Antarctica is really meant to be envisaged like this from a from a polar perspective. And when we plot it that way, it looks it looks clean. So this, this part that crosses the date line here, it's actually set up there to join on each side. Like it's it's the same coordinate in the long mat space, but in projected it's coincident. And to plot that, I've actually got the matrix of long lat coordinates out of the maps package, like out of that maps object, and I just treat it as a matrix and I call it with this proj string with the RG, RGDAO project function. Um, with the world symbol, because this is a spatial polygons data frame, a sort of a, an SF, predated SF. Um, it's the same call, but it's SP transform on the object. And we have this yucky scene, because the where the polygon was extended to the South Pole, those two points are coincident at, at minus 180, 180 and minus 90. And that's just not a bit of the coastline of Antarctica in the middle. That exercise is just about defining our own data and adding it to that map. Um, Real, I said this before, so I'm plotting the, the coastline of Antarctica again in a projection. Um, 
and then I'm trying to draw it as polygons, and it, it just doesn't work. We actually have to have a polygon object that, that works in this space. The details of why that's the case, I can't remember, but it's not fixable. We, we actually just have to get a polygon data set that's sensible. Um, it knows how to join the lines correctly, but it doesn't know to how to fill them as a polygon properly. And there's the intersection chain, so that that dummy point's just not there. You can just see the fact that this self intersects, I think. So minus 90s are down here a little bit. So another projection that looks like this but is in di completely different units is, is Makeda. So we'll quite commonly see that for a, a whole world map. Um, it's specified by the, the Merck family. Um, and if we look at the range of the coordinates, it's, it's essentially this sort of 2 million, it's this 20 million range, which is kind of the width of the Earth. So we've got data that, that goes all the way across the longitude range of the Earth, but here we, we, don't, we don't go all the way to the north and the south because Mercator's not defined to that level. Um, and that was really just trying to use the polygons in the map package with the projection as well, and it just gets worse. We can't actually deal with things that way. Part of it's like the, the points get reprojected across the date line and they end up in the west because they're kind of coincident on that side. Um, but it's really just more, we just we can't actually extend the maps package into this stuff. We need proper spatial objects. And this is a uh, this is a raster data set of sea surface temperature in the Southern Ocean. So it's in the it's in the stars package, um, but I'm using raster to read it. This is the net CDF with global ocean temperature. And it's defined for the whole world between minus 180 and one, plus 180 and minus 90 and, and 90. Um, I'm projecting it with raster to our lambda as a muffle projection on the pole and we see we, we lose half the data. So. It's pretty ugly and it just it hasn't given us the Western Hemisphere. Um, and the reason is that it's in this zero to three sixty range. So so the I'll show that actually. We'll go into R. I'll go back to what I was doing and wait for a, in a different way. So that, that SST data set is actually its Pacific view. And it, the fact is it just, it just doesn't work to project it. Um, and what we have to do is what raster calls rotate. So if I rotate a, a raster that's in the 0 C 360 convention, it, it's, it simply takes the west and patches it back to the east. And, and turns it into minus 180. Like, it's quite hard to do on your own. So Rasta has this specific function to do it. Rotate's kind of a funny name for it, um, and it's not really a general thing. It just it just does that exact convention fix. And then we actually do get you know a semblance of 
a world looking plot by reprojecting that raster. But there's a sampling problem at the date line. Yeah. Um, another key problem is that like straight lines that we see in longitude latitude are, are really curved. So, so meridian lines are, um, are great circles and latitude lines are, are lines of constant direction. Um, and so if we want to specify them in a, in a projection, we really actually had to add the curvature that they had. So these longitudes aren't aren't curving around latitude because we've only got one point at each end for them. And we can't, we can't add extra vertices now because it's, it's too late. It's, it's the wrong line in this projection. So when I created this, these graticule lines in, in, lat, in longitude and latitude, I really needed to add more points to them before I reproject them. Um, and you'll see that you sort of see that problem comes up a fair bit. Uh, other key problems are the, the pole is undefined in Mercata. So here I've taken the longitude minus 180 and latitude 0 and just project that single coordinate to Mercata. So I end up with this minus 20,000 or so, which is the right value for the, the westernmost extent. Um, and a number that's very close to zero. So it's not exactly zero, but that's, that's zero at the, at the centre of the projection at latitude. If I go to minus 60, I end up with this, this small negative valley, or this large negative valley for, for far south at 60. But if we go to 90, it, it comes out as infinite, because it's literally undefined. Um, and if you look at, usually they'll truncate Mercator at 85, because it's really getting really tall and, and silly towards the poles. It's, it's really unsuitable. Um, sensible wants to use for the poles of stereographic and lambert as a muffle, the equal area. And they're more or less identical over a large area. So like th this was something that really confused me for a long time. Like and we don't when we reproject data we end up with numbers that are that just to X and Y but they don't have any familiarity to us. Like they're just arbitrary numbers that you know, we can't, we can't kind of look at their ranges and, un and understand what they are. Um, here I've, I've taken the same central point and orientation for two projections and I transform the same data to each of them and then I just plot them over one, one on each other. So it's a completely invalid map with two projections mixed together. But the fact is that Antarctica in these projections is exactly the same. Like we wouldn't even notice, you know, to within, you know, we wouldn't even notice unless we zoom right in to see that they're slightly different. The Lambert as a muffle area one is, is starting to run out at about here because that, that's literally what happens. It, it doesn't, it kind of, it squashes in on that, that circle. Whereas stereographic is really different. It actually goes out very fast, like as you get to higher latitudes, it, you would see land masses out here. And when you plot that, you kind of see Greenland and this, you know, uninterpretable Arctic Ocean, and you can't even see Antarctica because it's so small in the middle. Um, but the fact is, these are basically the same within this kind of local, local region. They just have very different, like, um, properties. In the, in the outer boundaries. Um, and so while the Indian continent here, like this is really too big, like it's, that's really exaggerated now, it's really the wrong size, whereas here it's the wrong shape. So in the black one it's equal area, so relative to Antarctica it's got the right area, but it's got the completely wrong shape. Out here, it's got the right shape, but the wrong area. And that's exactly what we're doing, letting go one of these properties or the other. But they're more or less exaggerated in different regions of the map. So you can kind of, if you know these properties, you can kind of leverage, you can get the right combination of properties that you need. Um, stereographic's reasonably easy to understand. So it's that ray point 
shooting through the sphere, and I'll show that in a minute. Lambert as a muffle is much more complicated in that it's it's like a I don't know how to describe it. It's like a circle centered on the it's a circle centered on the central point that goes up and, and hits that point on the map. I'll try and show that. So in this plot here, take, like I'll move it around so you can kind of get perspective on it. But the, the blue is longitude, latitude, coastline represented as, a, as geocentric coordinates. And then the green is the, the Lambert azimuth equal area, oh sorry, the stereographic south polar map projected from that. So I've made a selection of white lines from the North Pole. So it's, it's from the North Pole because we're centred on the South Pole for our projection. It would be the other way around if we chose the North Pole. And each white line, as it, as it, as it extends out and, and intersects a point on the globe, where it hits that green plane is where it's drawn on the, on the projection. So that's, that's just how that works. Um, I'm trying to build up a family of these kind of plots to explain different projections because I find that really helpful to, to understand. Um, the azimuth equal area is quite different, so there's a bit more going on on this map. The stereographic one is, is truncated because otherwise we wouldn't see the globe very well. It would, it would, the green would extend out too far, so it's, it's been clipped. But this one's got the entire globe on it because the, the Lambert one sort of squashes, squashes in as it gets to the bounds. Um, I'm sending a ray from the South Pole to the point on the, on the, on the Earth in XYZ and the white lines are the kind of circle that, that are made. So the centre of the circle is on the South Pole and it intersects the point on the map and then where the circle hits the plane is, is the map coordinate. So I don't know how you do that like mathematically but that's somehow someone figured out that's, that's how it works and you get an equal area projection. I was going to show that SST object. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> It comes back to life in a while. All right, I'll go back to that later. So in this section, we're kind of talking about um, a technique I've figured out for extracting raster data with polygons, because um, that's something we have to do quite a lot of. We've done these sort of ecosystem an analyses to process remote sensing data into time series summaries. So we're trying to detect which region of the Southern Ocean are changing which ways for, for ecosystem analysis. And um, we wanted to define these partitions carefully in the Southern Ocean and, and in this one we actually crossed the date line too because for us this, this sector has meaning as, a, as, a, as an ocean basin that has 
its own properties and its own kind of regions of interest. Um, the middle, the middle zone division is sort of closely about where the main Antarctic currents are. So it doesn't exactly align to physical properties, but it's it's pretty much southern Antarctic waters are different from northern Antarctic waters. Um, and then there's a real close coastline region in, in here. Um, and most of the data that we look at is going to be in long lat grids. So we just need a mapping between pixels that are in, in longitude latitude rasters and these polygons. Um, and sometimes you see like like in the previous section I projected the raster to this projection. But that's really the wrong way to do it. You really sh should be figuring out which pixels belong in these polygons and then, and then group them by which polygon they belong in. Because it's really expensive to process raster data. Like, and if you've got really long time series, you've got a really big job to, to project all that data and then make it, you know, you're making a copy of it and storing another copy of it and looking after it. Um, in terms of, and, and this, this is defined in Lambert as a mathematical area because they're the properties I wanted for the polygons. I wanted to know exactly what their area was and I wanted that to be a constant across the map. And we're not extending too far north that we have to worry about that, um, the, sh the shape of things. It's, it's close enough to correct in this case. So. And when we, we have remote sensing data of sea ice concentration and it goes, it's one of the oldest remote sensing sources, it goes back to 1978. Um, it doesn't have a coverage problem either. So we've got the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere every day since 1988, and I think up to 1988 it was twice daily. And it's not affected by cloud because it's passive microwave. So it's actually a really interesting daily remote sensing time series data set to, to play with. Um, it's it's in a polar stereographic projection, so it's 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 different to this one, um, but really because they're the same region and they've got the same orientation, we don't have any shape problems. I can reproject the I can reproject the the polygons to the stereographic grid, and then they're they're in exactly the same space, and I can I can do a an extract on the on the pixels in the in the ice data. But uh, when it comes to the sea surface temperature, there's, there's a problem. So one is that it's, it's in this 0 to 360. And reprojecting it, we lose that Western Hemisphere, as we looked at before. OK, so this server's come back to life, so I'll have a look at this object. So this is... Um, it's stored in the SARS package because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simplified copy of a, a daily data set since 1982. This is a, one of the first ones in the time series. So, yeah, it goes back to, like, 1981. And you can see the extent. It's got this minus 1 to, to 359. So it's, it's really 0 to 360. Um, and there's that raster function rotate. It puts it back. I've got a one-off problem, but it, it's close enough to, to minus 180 to 180. And if you look at... The data wasn't stored properly in stars, unfortunately. We need to fix that. So, and this is kind of how it's delivered from the, the model that creates it. It's, it's built in a Pacific view, and so they deliver it on that grid, 0 to 360. Um, but if I want to reproject it, and I would only do that to make a picture, I'd, you know, I would do my analyses on the original data. But that weird function, raster rotate, does exactly that. It takes the, the Western Hemisphere and patches it back to the other side.
And so trying to get to our polar polygons, like so ostensibly, you know, we could we could use this rotated raster SST and I could project them all to Lambert Azimuth equal area. But that really implies like a remodeling of the data. And you know, this it probably doesn't matter for a simple property like SST, like but I'd really have to resample the data with interpolation and I'm creating my own new product. Um, And as well as being expensive to compute that, it's actually kind of spurious, like because I don't have any expertise in modeling SST. You know, it'd be better to use the data as delivered. And there's like ten thousand days of this stuff to process. And when you get into climate models, it's much more. You know, there's much there's, there's higher resolution, it goes into 3D, there's if forecast and hindcast, so there's there's a lot more of this data. Um, and so this kind of problem of actually reprojecting it becomes out of hand. Um, and this is a, a longitude latitude version of the polygons I showed before. So we've got the kind of uh, the subantarctic waters here, the Antarctic waters, and then the coastal Antarctic waters. But really, these are these are two incompatible versions. Like to make these polygons, I literally had to make two copies, and I've just carefully made sure that in the polar version, these are exactly the same coordinates, but here there's two pieces, so that I can plot them and use them in extractions in this context. And I, I don't see any other way around that. Like, there's no way to kind of cleanly project from here to polar or from polar to here. It's like we kind of need to carefully build two copies of this data set for for that purpose. Yeah, so that's kind of naively trying to transform the polar polygons back to back to this grid, and you can see it's just broken because because the two things the, the the polygons in the pole in the pole version don't have that cut across the date line, so they end up stretched and turned inside out and turned into rubbish, and it's not going to work. Yeah, and it was a bit of work up front, but it really made life simpler. So I had a one-to-one, -one, two copies of polygons, and I could just sort of work with them when I need one or the other in different contexts. Um, and so the trick of like not having to reproject raster data to to this polar perspective is to build an index between them, um, and. There's a new a newish package on CRAN. It's a couple of years old now, but it's called Fasterize. And I think like if you've ever tried to rasterize polygons in R, it was kind of really hellishly slow for, for except for anything except really really tiny examples. Um, but this is this is ridiculously fast. It has to be it has to be an SF format. Um, but the cool thing about rasterizing polygons is, it, is it's exactly saying what pixels belong to which polygons. So you can kind of invert the answer and say, like this is giving you a mapping. Like when I rasterize the value of the ID of the polygon, I end up with a raster copy that tells me which polygon every pixel belongs to. And it's really fast in raster to look up pixels by cell. So. So every like this is cell one up here in the top left, and it belongs to, you know, the dark green polygon, whatever it's called. And all these pixels in here belong to that polygon. And so I only have to look up, I only have to pull out all the pixels in an SST data set, and I've got the right grouping of which polygon they belong to. And that absolutely transformed the way I thought about processing these big data sets. Because it's kind of like a little geometry trick at the beginning, but then it's going to apply to 10,000 layers of raster data, and I don't have to do this really computationally demanding work just to look up pixels. So the nitty gritty of doing that. Um, so what have I done? So this, so raster polys, I've called it. So this is like a it's a it's really a copy of SST layer without any SST data in it. It's got it's now like the index of the polygon. 
by running a fasterized function. Um, I have to turn the longitude latitude polygons into SF format. And I'm rasterizing to that C temp that I put in the 180, minus 180, 180 orientation. Um, and the field is a row number that I've given it. So there's kind of a little bit of plumbing to, to get the answer, but but then this, you know, the legend here is like one to twelve of my of my twelve polygon data set. It's it's fairly straightforward. Um, and I don't even have to run extract like like cause I've got the I've got the cell like for every cell in that raster I've got a polygon index or I've got an NA. And so then I pull out all the values. All the values of the raster polys is the polygon index. So I'm making a, a data frame. And the cell is like how many cells do we have? So I've got one to n cell. And that's kind of my index table. So a lot of the polygon indexes are going to be zero. So I'll, I'll throw them away when I don't need them. But now I have, in, in raster's indexing form, like so the first valid one's at 691,000, because it's global and we're ignoring the top hemisphere. Then their polygon's 12 down to, down to 1. Um, and so that table's like a, this table, this cell table's now like a mapping between that raster pixel and the polygons it belongs to. And and so for this day, this raster that I can read, you know, with one call with raster function, I extract that cell number from it, and it goes. I've now got the the temperature value on this on this index table. And so the next step then is then use dplyr. So I'm grouping by polygon because I say I want the mean or I want the min and the max. And Group by polygon ID and run summarize for, for whatever functions I want to call on all those pixel values. And so, therefore, all my 12 polygons in the pile, I've got the, the mean, the standard deviation, and the min and the max of the, the temperature from that one day. Um, if I did those steps kind of with raster functions natively, it, would, it takes time. Like, it takes time to look up all the polygons like which pixel belongs in which polygon. But I've really just done that job once, and then I'm saying I'm going to keep that answer and apply it to 10,000 time slices. And um, it takes 18 seconds to do that. So 18 seconds times 10,000 means you know, you've got a couple of days. You maybe get it wrong, and you've got to start again. Um, you know, you've got to really you've manage your time when you've got a big job like that. But having built this index, this really means then we can go and visit every file, and there's no time. It's less than a second to do each lookup, so it's more like an hour or two. I think were we going to have a break? At yeah, I. I, I think he had just said three, but I'm not sure. Uh, didn't Tom write that uh, we can decide when we want to make a break? Okay. That's not scheduled. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well... Yeah, it's so like it's not because I want it's not because I want a raster version of the polygons. It's that it's that I want to like if so. I think I mean we're all familiar with R, right? So we we have a raster and we run we have polygons and we say extract from the raster these polygons with the mean function, yeah, and that it's 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 fa it's famously quite slow. Um, but 
what we what what it's doing is identifying which pixel belongs to which polygon, and then you know for each polygon saying okay, get me the values of all those cells, and do the calculation, and then do it for the next polygon, and so on. The the, the time taken is actually figuring out which pixels in which polygon. But if you if you rasterize the polygon, but you don't rasterize the value of the polygon. Like you, you rasterize the index of the polygon. Then, and there's 12 polygons, so we've got, you know, value 12 is is this polygon here. And one is is one of these little ones down here. Then I've kind of done that. I've done that classification job up front. So every pixel now knows which polygon it belongs to. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's really that like that one up that that one step. We might do that every time. Like so, we've got ten thousand days of of a raster time series, and it's it's going to take twenty seconds to do that lookup. So we this is sort of a way to do the lookup once, you know, spend that twenty seconds, store the index, and then go and apply it to to every ten thousand slices of raster. Yeah, I find it hard because it's not really like f rasterizing polygons is not really what we're doing. Like, I'm saying build an index between pixel and polygon, but the fact is that's that that is doing exactly that job. Yeah, we have to be careful not to be cropping it as well. So like, you know, like like the cell numbers aren't absolute; they're kind of relative to how big the raster is. So, like here, I've kept the the original extent of the raster, I'm just, I'm just going to ignore most of the pixels in the north. Um. Yeah, well, it, it just really means that, like, I'm... So I've got raster data that comes in a, it comes in its own projection. But I'm doing an analysis in a polar projection. So actually what I, you know, what I need to not do is convert all the raster data that, to that projection, but simply figure out the mapping between my polygons and the pixels that, in that space. Yeah. I've sort of struggled to um, find ways to, exp like show examples of this clearly because like it really it only really matters when you've got thousands and thousands of files to process it might be worth um, running through the code a bit as well So, I mean, I've glossed over the code a bit, so I'll, I'll speak to that a bit more in a bit more detail. So, So I'm treating like so C temp 180 is is just an example raster. It it actually matches a a really long time series of a remote sensing data, um, about 10,000 days worth. And 
my polygons, like I have two copies of them, right? So I have, oh, I've got the, what did I call them? I haven't run the setup code. So AS zone is it stands for anti. Uh, I've actually forgotten. Antarctic Ecosystem Assessment. I've got a total mind blank on what that is, but that's just you know it's just like a project specific um, abbreviation. And you know we're working in this we're working with this model that has to be on the on on this polar projection, and so this this covers the southern region of this SST data set. But it, it doesn't map cleanly over into the space of this raster, this global raster. I've got another copy of these polygons that I've defined in LONLAT so that they do map over cleanly to the raster. And I've put LL on their names to say they're LONLAT. And so those two, these two things, the, the temperature and the polygons. Now do have, they, they have a clear relationship in the, in the native space of the raster. Um, and if I use raster extract, And I don't want to get 600,000 values. So I'll give it a function to, to take an aggregate value. And I'll just get the mean. I think I can only do one function at once, right? So I'd have to do this for mean and max and standard deviation. No, it was actually quicker than I thought. But so that's given me those, those 12 values back. And... It was quicker than I thought, but it still it takes a bit of time, and it's um, it take more time on a, on a bigger grid. But the time is all about which pixel belongs to which polygon. Yeah, so like like some hundreds of thousands of pixels have gone into each polygon, and you know this code here has had to figure that out. And if I go and do that on a time series, it's got to do it every single time. What Fasterize does there's a funny name for rasterizing is it it takes the polygons. and burns them into a grid. So here I'm using C temp. But it doesn't care about the values in ctemp. It's ignoring those. It's just treating like you've got this grid in minus 180, 180. And I'm going to tell it what, what value do you want me to burn into the grid. And I want it to burn in the... the row number of the polygon. So there's 1 to 12. I think, uh, yeah, you know, that's right. I wouldn't have, that wouldn't have happened. So I won't error that all. So the polygon layer, you know, has a bunch of data on it for each sector, but I've added this row index, which is 1 to 12. It already has, yeah, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, you know, and when I run faster eyes, oh dear. Q 
What's wrong with that? SF. Has to be in the right format. <laughs> and then you make a typo. And so RAS polys, it's, it's a raster with exactly the same structure but totally different data. And its data is the polygon index. Um, and, and every pixel has a, like it has an index, you know, the index starts up here at 1 and we're down at about 600,000 down here. And when I make the table, I'm going to ignore all those. First of all, I make the one to n cell column. And I get out the value of the polygon for the pixel. And that's essentially like a grouping table. So which pixel belongs to which polygon? Yeah, is it? Oh, uh, look, it, it actually, I mean, in this, uh, this is, again, one of those particular things, like, um, like here we wanted it, like, I've drawn that line over the top, that's, that's not part of the polygons. We wanted these to be single polygons and not multi-polygons. Um, in this instance, they could have been multi-polygons, but it kind of just confuses the thing because we wanted just 12 and not have to think about it. And like, and be able to, you know, just use the same data set and make, make a plot. And so it's like, like to me, the people that I work with when we're writing reports and making maps, it was just easier to just have this one and not have to think about that seam. Yeah, whereas when we're doing extractions, and we, we just have a process which says these two data sets are the same, you know, they're just in different coordinate systems. Yeah, and that, you know, I think that's quite a powerful idea, like it's, you know, sometimes there's no way around it, you know, like we can automate ourselves kind of 80% of the time, well, probably 95% of the time, but every now and again, it's like you just, you've actually got to do this careful thing and document it and keep a record and I think because of the vagaries of the way polygons and lines and stuff are stored, we, we can't really avoid that sometimes. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, I mean, and we can do that in memory in R too. But I I just find that a bit a little bit scary. Like I don't know I don't know why. Like it's it's just not in this is not in my workflow yet. You know, like it's kind of easy to go. Oh, these two things are separate, and I'm not going to mix them up. You know, like yeah. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did. In, I mean, in a later project, I've actually I got a bit more strict. Like I, I was keeping just the ID, you know, like well, even just keeping the geometries, and then I've got the data somewhere else. And when I'm using one or the other, I just I just patch it in, you know. And 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 it's a transient object. Like it's helpful for my workflow. But yeah, that that's a good that's a good point. You don't want them to kind of diverge. You see that too often. Okay, so um, I've got a colleague, uh, Dale Machetti, and he went to use R last year, but he's, he's been really... Um, we, we sort of toyed with these map problems for a few years, and we kind of like... A couple of us have figured out a way to round these problems all the time, but, but Dale's really pushed us to, to like, let's, let's write a package that can do this. And he's, he's really... Um, he's been instrumental in building this package. It's been amazing, like... And it's still got a long way to go, but I think we're going to be using it quite a lot for our work. Um, so there's a couple of nice features it's got. 
Um, the key thing is we wanted to, you know, people like, they want a map, you know, they're going to want bathymetry, they're going to want coastline. Um, you have sort of management polygons and physical features that we, that we commonly use. So we sort of wanted just a little box of tricks that had all those things on hand. Um, and we've been surprised how many we can get in, you know, like in about just 20 megabytes in an R package. And so it's really specific to our institute, but it's, it's a really handy thing to do. Um, and making maps is really different from the analysis that we do. They're really different modes of working, like getting into a publication map, I think, than the kind of tricks you do when you're doing analysis are quite different. Um, and the other thing this is good for is that a lot of people's maps are quite specific. You know, like, it's, we don't want this whole southern ocean, we just want this little bit of Prids Bay. And so really what starts that map is their data. And so we want something to be able to just kind of get us a reasonable picture in a projection in the pole with bathymetry in the background. And, and then we can kind of collaboratively improve that map together. Once, you, once you've got a sketch of where you're trying to go, it's a lot easier to, to finish it. Um, so SOMAP, so that stands for Southern Ocean Map. It's available on GitHub if you're interested to, uh, to explore it. Um, so that little bit of code can, in, can install it for you. It does have a bit of data in it, so it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bigger package than normal. Um, and it has quite a lot of dependencies too, so it's, I didn't kind of include it as a, as a requirement. Um, and, and Dale really designed this. He kind of found this kind of way to put the, the border around it, which he really likes. Um, and all we have to do is call SOMAP, and it makes this background for us. And um, then we've got more tools to kind of add data to this. Uh, it's got a lot of options. So the trim is kind of saying, which latitude do you want me to cut the data down to? Because sometimes we want to be really focused in, and sometimes we want a bit more of Australia and so on in it. Um, and he's got a bunch of data sets included, like, like proposed EEZ regions and Camelar management zones. Um, one thing I'm really interested in in R is, is not having to think about what projection stuff's in. Like we often have longitude latitude data or we have objects. And so if I've made a plot with a projection, I should be able to just throw data at it and have it sorted out. You know, like like GISs do that. Um, I don't know why it hasn't kind of been embedded for a long time, but it's just not something that's kind of in the culture. Like we tend to have to do this to all of our data make sure it's all in the right projection and then get it on the, on the plot. Um, so what I'm doing here is creating a sequence of points. So, and I'm going over the date line just to be a, just to be a bit, bit dangerous. Um, so I'm getting a longitude every 10, a latitude every a latitude at five, so at a constant at 55 south, and I turned it into a, an SP data frame of points, and I'm telling it's long lat data. So that's the kind of data we would commonly have. We might read a shape file, um, and because we've created this SOMAP object, it, what, what it's done is actually registered that it it's got the polar stereographic projection and it just records that somewhere. And so when we use these functions in SOPROJ, they're, just, they're expecting to, to look up this, this projection that belongs to the map we're currently using. And so if I SOPROJ my points, and I, I've started the map again, so map, and then I plot them and add equals true, it, it just does the right thing. So I've gone from long lat data to the the projection that I'm using currently without really having to do all the plumbing for it. Um, I'm, I don't even have to sort of SO proj it. Like if I, if I create the, the SO map and then I SO plot data, 
it's not only going to add it by default, because that's the kind of context we're working in, it's going to project it to the map for us. I don't have to think about, you know, have I done, have I done the right coordinate transformation and keeping another copy of the object and all this sort of stuff. Uh, so again, this another example. So SOMAT trim is minus 30, so I'm extending out to, to 30 south, so I'll get a bit more of Australia in my home. Uh, I'm getting this sort of local copy of the SST raster, so I'm cropping it down to a bit that's a bit more Australia and Indian Ocean focus. And then I say plot that, and it, it knows how to do it. It transforms the raster and, and sticks it on the map for me. I can control the colours and stuff. There's options up here. Um, and then I'm creating a contour version of that, that SSC data in LONLAT, and then, again, adding this to the plot, and it does the same thing. It, it reprojects it for me. And it kind of gets us this 80% of the way. Like, I've got my data in, a, in, a, in LONLAT, or I've got it in an object, and I can just kind of get it chucked on the map, and I've got this kind of prototype map that I want to the details of. Yeah. yeah, so that's the end of the content that I created. So there's there's a bunch of simple exercises through through the notes there. Um, and I also thought like if you've got your own data and you want to make a a map with them, like maybe we could have a bit of a a discussion about things or help each other make work with different projections. Yeah. Yeah, that should be all right, actually. Yeah, yeah, it should be. So, so there are a bunch of sort of heavy and difficult packages in that mix, but but our Studio Cloud pulls them off um, binary installs. So there's copies of Linux binaries for it. Yeah, should work. <laughs> the, the baseline issue is from they have um, shipping tracks globally and um, wants to, to measure travel times between different harbors. Like, uh, what would be is there any good projection to get or, or local speed really wise? So um, is there any projection which would en ensure that I can measure speeds between consecutive points everywhere on the globe? Also, is that worth the, the baseline? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I think, I mean, in that context, I would. I would, I would be using an ellipsoidal algorithm. Um, and I mean, there's and there's a bunch of them. Like, yeah, I, I just don't think there is a projection that can that can do that. <laughs> I mean, you can if you can batch your if you can batch your tr your segments into into local areas, you know, you could project them to a, an equidistant yeah. with, you know, near enough that centre is going to be going to be fine. But, you know, I, I just find that's really kind of brute force. Like, yeah, yeah, it's like like it's it's trigonometry one way or the other. So, I, you know, I, I think I think if you can get a fast enough distance calculator, it's it's better. Yeah, and there's and I mean the other because the other side of it is there are like there's a new ellipse, there's a new distance algorithm like from 2013 by Carney. I only kind of understood this recently, but it's 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 not fast, but it's robust. You know, so it can do it can do like all the way around the world. And there was some there were some classic problems with with um, Vincenti and Haversine that. You know they couldn't handle certain cases, but this one sorted it out. But it's quite, it's quite expensive. But but say if your if your if your segments are always going to be relatively short, 
there's there's other shortcut algorithms. So like Mapbox has this cheap cheap ruler, and so and that's really written for or maybe it's Uber. Anyway, it's basically for tra for tra traffic distances. You know, so it can um, it's only meant to be used in a in a small context. And if your lines are longer than something, then you really shouldn't be using it. So, yeah, I don't, there's no way around. Like, like you kind of got to know all the all the, th the options that are available to you. There's no, there's no one thing that can do all that. Yeah. You know, and again, in, in some cases, like so, like some migration routes, like um, the the sheer, the sheer water, they're, they're very, um, they're really kind of structured. Like, like they go from the Antarctic coastline, or well, the ones that we track from Tasmania. And they, you know, they they go to the Antarctic coastline and then back up through the Pacific to Alaska and Japan, mm -hmm. and so you kind of could along that axis say, you know, this is a sensible projection because they're not going to go outside that, that yeah. bounds. But I mean, apart from that, I don't think there's, there's one projection that can do it.
I don't know. Oh, they had, no, they did have drinks, uh, crates. Yeah.
also one is the um, one is the Paul version, and Elel is the long life version. So, so A E S I is what we yeah that's kind of the foundation of the word. But the the Elel, the long longitude and latitude, you can get a copy of that. Just carefully. You know, to, like like splitting, you've got to split across the day line and then, and then go to the next copy of it. So what do you do? Say the time for the beginning. What is that, sorry? The, the say the time. Ah, oh, sorry, yeah, that's a, that's, yeah, it's it's really the anti-meridian. So, so it's the line of longitude at 180 degrees. Yeah, I shouldn't say day line, it's really like, it's a very um, provincial kind of name. Yeah, they use it, that it's called that because you kind of, you go over it, you, you go back 24 hours in local time. So it kind of, it's the one place in the world where you skip a time zone, but you're actually going back up an entire day. should call it the anti-meridian. Is that a term that like makes sense? Yeah, the, so the anti, like the prime meridian is what we call the, the zero longitude in English. And um, yeah, the anti-meridian is kind of the, the, the opposite side of that. So it's at, at the 180 minus 180 mark. Yeah, that's Yeah, so I mean, like, natively, when we, this is really what we use as our reference. But the, we, we can't, I can't really dynamically convert that into the other form when I need it. Um, and I, I don't think there's a solution to that. Really, the solution was, you know, make, maintain two copies and just make sure they're, they're equivalent. Yeah, and then Nita's point was a really good one. That's what you could use multiple geometry columns for. That would be a much better way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's four now, so it's sort of officially break time if you want. But I'm happy to discuss anything.